Blomcast. Turning Points in History. Wendepunkte in der Geschichte. Hello and welcome to the Blomcast, the podcast in which I, Philip Blom, look at turning points in history. And today we have possibly the big one, the rise of AI. Yes, you've all heard about it. You've heard about chat GPT. You've heard about newly generated images, essays, poems, etc. And you know that this is only the beginning. These are systems that are not designed to perform a specific tasks. These are systems that are designed to learn themselves in ways that we no longer understand. Now this is a big deal, but frankly there are people who are better qualified than me to talk about the implications of artificial intelligence for our lives and indeed for the future of humanity. What interests me as an historian here is that this is Another chapter, possibly the decisive chapter, in a much longer and much older story. And this story is the relationship between man, or shall we say today, humanity and machine. And this is a very old story and a story that tells you as much about how humans think about themselves as indeed they think about technology and how they design technology. The story of man and machine takes us right back to Daedalus and Icarus. Icarus, of course, famously, who flies too close to the sun with the wings that his father has fashioned for him. And the wax in the wings melts and he falls into the sea as a symbol for humanity's hubris, perhaps, of flying too close to the sun. But the legend isn't that clear. Daedalus was a Greek engineer, a Greek inventor, an ingenious man who was brought to Crete to house and indeed imprison the Minotaur, the fearsome half bull and half man creature who demanded sacrifice and who was immured by Daedalus because of his great ingenuity in a labyrinth. But Daedalus wanted to flee the island and so he built himself wings and also built a set for his son with the results you know. But by the way, Daedalus himself escaped. He didn't fly too close to the sun and perhaps This is not so much a moral fable about humanity overreaching, but it is simply a reflection of nature that if you fly too close to the sun, you will drown. But if you hug the horizon as Daedalus did, you get away with it. You can become the world's first cyborg, the world's first combination of man and machine. Now, machines were of some importance for all culture. I mean, what, what are machines? Machines are things that augment human capacities and often also imitate them, but perhaps also really complex things, not just like a spoon or a knife, but something with moving parts and something that also needs power from somewhere. And you see human ingenuity straining against the limitations of the technologies of the day when you look at the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci and you see him trying to find new ways of making people fly, making people fearsome warriors, of designing all sorts of new machines for human use. But these machines were always limited by the fact that if you wanted to have a tank, as he designed, you needed horses inside or in front of it, which made them vulnerable, of course. So machines never really, as it were, took off until there was a vast change because machines do work and the work needs energy and that energy was supplied for the longest time by either wind and water, if you had a mill, or perhaps by animal strength or human strength. And those were basically the possibilities of making machines work. And you can imagine how we are going from here because in the Renaissance there was a fascination for automata, so for 
very ingeniously designed little machines that worked with clockwork mainly and of course with the spring of a clockwork you have another and hidden source of energy and people were delighted to see these things run across the table and seemingly move like life and it was part of also a philosophical search of what actually distinguished life and dead things. So the automata were a diversion. They were interesting. They threw up philosophical questions like, like the legend of the golem did as well. But they didn't actually do much work. They weren't economically important. They gave nobody an advantage on the battlefield. And so they didn't really take off. Now, in the course of the 18th century, something changes. The interest in all things mechanical becomes intensified. Also, of course, we've now got scientists doing research and we've got engineers doing research and we've got all sorts of inventions that all of a sudden make nature more manipulable, more understandable. You get microscopes and telescopes, you get accurate clocks to measure time, but also, of course, to measure distance and position. And so it becomes a world that is, as it were, more amenable to machines. But in a previous podcast, I talked about the fire pump. It is the podcast on why utopias fail. And this fire pump, which was described by the savants of the 18th century as a bit of a philosophical conundrum, but what they didn't understand and didn't see was that they were looking at an early steam engine. And I think there's a lesson in this, namely that we only recognize what we are, as it were, groomed to recognize what our surroundings make us recognize. But this, of course, is the key to the next chapter in the story with the steam engine you suddenly get machines that can do work themselves and do work at a vastly larger scale than was possible before. And you get a whole world of industrialization, or you get a whole manufacturing industry. Of course, British colonialism turned out to be of key importance in here because Basically, the colonial administration insisted that the cotton that was harvested in India had to be brought to Britain to be spun and woven and was then sold back to Indians as finished, sometimes even dyed cloth, of course, at a multiple of the price. Now, that was a huge incentive to get the spinning and weaving industry in England going with ever more ingenious machines and ever more humans being replaced by these rattling nightmares sometimes that um, would turn out product and were no longer a fit place for humans. I mean, this is also the time when the misery of industrialization is at its greatest. A few decades later, a certain Friedrich Engels will turn up with his friend Karl Marx and see the state of the workers and how they're living. Um, so at this moment, the relationship between man and machine really shifts. And you get much more skeptical voices all of a sudden because the machines seem to take a much greater amplitude, a much greater potential. And also science does, of course. This is the time, the early 19th century, when Mary Shelley writes her famous novel, Dr. Frankenstein's Monster. And although the monster is not himself a machine, he is a project, product of scientific ingenuity and he is a product that tests the limits of the difference between live things and dead things and that tests the human power to create and to play God, basically. Now, in Frankenstein, this story doesn't go back, it go very well. And at roughly the same time, the German poet Johann Wolfgang von Goethe writes a ballad called The Sorcerer's Apprentice, where a sorcerer's apprentice tries to save himself from some work by animating tools and letting them do the work themselves. But of course, those tools go completely out of control. And in the end, he has to 
he has to beg the sorcerer himself to make these things stop. But um, you can imagine that in society there may not be a great sorcerer there who can make things stop when they go out of control. So we have a development where the relationship between man and machine becomes more and more ambivalent. And when I say man and machine here, then I must say in the public imagination of the time, at least the relationship between woman and machine is simply something that isn't given much scope in the literature, in art, etc. But of course it is the relationship between humanity and the machines it uses. And there's another great shift coming. We're coming towards the end of the 19th century, the early 20th century, and all of a sudden millions of people live in the world of machines. They live in big cities, they use trains, they eat industrially produced food, they eat meat that is imported by refrigerated ships, they go to cinemas and watch films. All of a sudden, machines become very much a part of people's daily lives, at least in the developed industrialized countries. And a life without machines, a life without standardization, a life without the constant rattle of some engine or L other, this is also the time of the rise of cars, is more and more reserved for people who live in the deep countryside or who live in countries that are not yet industrialized. There is a huge caesura in this story, a huge break in this story, and that is at least for people in Western Europe and partly also in the United States, the experience of the First World War. In the United States, perhaps it was already anticipated in the experience of parts of the Civil War, but in the First World War, this becomes really brutal and especially so on the so-called Western Front, so in what is today Belgium and France, where Germany and the Allies clashed. What this experience was, was that in the modern world that people found themselves living in suddenly, there, was, there had also been a great crisis of masculinity. It became questionable all of a sudden what it meant to be a man, why it was important to be a man. And don't forget, men had all the responsibility and with that all the power, they had the whip hand, held all the financial strings in their hands. And in an industrialized society, the old ideal of masculinity simply no longer mattered, as feminist writers of the time pointed out. You didn't have to have a strong arm. You need, didn't need to be physically big or particularly courageous to work in a factory. You just needed to know which button to press. There was a huge crisis of was what was called neurasthenia at the time, basically mental breakdowns, nervous breakdowns, and they affected men more than others. And when the First World War came, there was part of the reason that it was at the beginning received with such enthusiasm was for many men especially, that they thought this would be their great chance to reclaim their masculinity saber in hand. And they found themselves sitting in trenches, and they found themselves sitting there with a Catholic, a Protestant, a Jew, an atheist, a communist, a conser Christian conservative, and a grenade that was lobbed or fired from 20 kilometers away would come and annihilate them all. And it no longer mattered how courageous they were, what they thought about the world, what they were made of, what their character or their religion was. Technology became so overwhelming that people no longer mattered. This is what you have in one description, one witness account after another, that faced with the barbed wire, faced with the machine guns, the tanks, the planes, and especially the artillery that could already cover very large distances quite accurately, human courage, human strength no longer mattered. The machines appeared to have won. 
There was a medical symptom associated with that, the so-called shell shock, where soldiers were so completely destroyed by the experience of the war that even if they hadn't been hurt physically, they were unable to control their bodies, they were unable to speak, they shook uncontrollably and for weeks or months. And it was clear that the machines were too powerful for human capabilities. You get an answer to that, a cultural answer, in the interwar period after 1918. You get it, first of all, in things like Dada and surrealism, artistic currents that were very iconoclastic, that broke with tradition, that broke with authority, that tried to show that the world was funded on non nonsense, on idiotic ideas, that beauty didn't exist, etc. And you can, I think, see a lot of the breakdown of a certain patriarchal authority because of the war because what this order had told people why they were dying for their fatherland was exposed as a complete lie, and that was often remarked on by, by people at the time. As the interwar period wore on, there were also other aspects of the relationship between man and machine, the sexy relationship between them. You get the design of the 20s and 30s, you get Art Deco, where the lines of machines merge with the lines of human bodies, where everything becomes sleek and metallic and swooping and swift and it is a world of breathtaking elegance and excitement. And this is a world of great technological optimism, but of course it is also the world in which you have a film like Fritz Lang's Metropolis, where Fritz Lang talks about this city that is subjected to a workers' rebellion, and so the dictator of the city sends a robot to lead the workers astray and destroy them, and this robot sends people, especially men, it is a female robot, into a frenzy, but it is also the evil technology that, that misleads people who are too simple to understand it. You get something similar in the play from which we've got the word robots, Yaroslav Chapik's ROR, Universal Robots, where robots take over the world and kill all people. And you feel all of a sudden the terrible ambiguity that has entered the relationship between people and the machines around them. And of course, this is also the time when machines slowly seep into people's households in the shape of, for instance, vacuum cleaners and then washing machines. Most of these are only acquired by people after the Second World War, but already before the first Second World War, they are around. Now, the relationship between people and machines has known many more chapters, and these chapters will be more familiar to us all. I mean, first of all, there was the nuclear threat, and the fact that humanity was all of a sudden faced with the possibility of its own extinction through its own technology. We've got something quite similar today with the climate catastrophe, but I think we are also we have finally crossed another threshold. First of all, we've crossed a threshold by technology becoming so abundant and so cheap that we are effectively all cyborgs already. We haven't got new eyes built in like the Terminator had in the movie. We haven't got things that are under our skin, or at least most of us don't, because some people already wear microchips under their skin, and of course already wear machines such as pacemakers, such as artificial um, hearing aids that are connected to the brain, etc. So um, there is a certain invasive tendency in these machines already, but also a mobile phone makes you into a kind of cyborg who is always plugged in, who is always online, who is always localizable, um, who is always reachable for all kinds of stimuli and all kinds of orders. And that is a state in which we um, in which we bring ourselves voluntarily. The sociologist Richard Sennett has written in his book The Craftsman about this 
relationship between people and machines in, in, in the case of the digital world that we live in, the digital devices that we handle every day and for many hours, and that, of course, change our brains and our practices in our doing so, because it's not just that the machines are becoming more compatible to us, we are also becoming more compatible with the machines. We are learning how we have to speak, to dictate well, to behave, to be recognized, or not to be recognized. We learn how to behave behave in the way that machines can interact with us. But also, of course, we interact with these machines in a way that is determined by algorithms that we do not understand and by priorities that may not be our priorities because they are by and large financial priorities. Um, these algorithms try to maximize our time, they try to intensify our emotions, etc. Now, all of that is stuff that you know, that you know of from other contexts. But let us get back to the relationship between human beings and machines. And let us see what is happening with this relationship when now human beings have developed machines that are no longer just there to execute orders. They're produced for a certain purpose but that will decide themselves how they will reach a goal and perhaps at times which goals they want to reach that are applicable to all sorts of areas that can do very difficult different tasks and that can do tasks many times faster using many times more data than human beings can. Now at the moment they are incredibly good for on, in certain things and not very good in others but I think we can assume that will change you know that the chief scientist of Google has just resigned because he saw too many dangers in this technology and he that you heard that technology moguls from all over the world are calling for a moratorium or not from all over the world because that is the way with all moratoriums if one of you stops researching the others will go on and some actor will always drive on this technology basically technology that is possible will also be developed and here we are entering terra incognita. We are entering a completely unknown territory. We do not know how this story will go on. What may be is that evolution has simply found another way for a higher intelligence, a more complex intelligence to flourish. And has found a way of fashioning this intelligence and has simply used Homo sapiens to do the fashioning to develop this higher intelligence that will no longer be carbon-based, but that will live in machines that will replicate themselves, that will think for themselves, and that will decide where they want to go next. And perhaps, by the way, also what to do with those humans that are still around and that those machines will probably regard, if we are very lucky, like we regard other primates. So this is the stuff of science fiction, but it is also the next chapter in the very old and very tumultuous relationship that human beings have had for millennia and certainly much more intensively for two centuries with the machines they have created and the ways that humans have seen themselves and the ways that they have made machines but also that the machines have changed them. I hope you enjoyed this podcast and I would be glad to hear from you. Leave me your comments, get in touch with me, give me suggestions for more episodes or simply tell all your friends about the Blomcast. What a fantastic podcast it is and that more people may want to listen to it. I am looking forward to meeting all of you for this time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.